Texas Lutheran University. Today uh, we celebrate our fifth annual Family Physics Night and tonight we'll be looking at um, the physics of the human experience or the human body specifically. Uh, what are the physics involved in a lot of different things that we sort of don't think about when we think about physics. So I think it's going to be a very fun night and here uh, to kick us off we have a special speaker and I'm going to introduce our Society of Physics Students President Vanessa Espinoza, who will introduce our special guest. Thank you all for being here. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, like Dr. T said, my name is Vanessa Espinoza. I'm the SPS president here, and I get to introduce our special guest today. Um, so today we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Julian Pollard. Dr. Pollard's hometown is Coral Gables, Florida. She received her Bachelor's of Science in Physics and Mathematics from the University of Miami. Following her undergraduate degree, she pursued her PhD at the University of California in Los Angeles. She is now an assistant professor in the thoracic, thoracic mm -hmm. service of radiation physics department at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Yes, it's a mouthful. It's a lot. Um, on top of all the amazing things she is accomplishing as a professor, she also has a clinical appointment in, at MD Anderson where she gets to interact with patients all the time. She is a very brilliant woman, and we had the pleasure to talk to her throughout the day. And so I really hope you enjoy her presentation. And without further ado, please, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Julian Pollard. Thank you. Thank you. So honestly, I want to first say thank you for welcoming, to, welcoming me to your university. I have never imagined what this experience would really entail. Because when Dr. Santi reached out to me and said, would you come on out to TLU? You, you know, know what I had to do just like any millennial? I had to Google it. I had to make sure what was I getting myself into. And I have to admit, as somebody who's part of a field of physics that doesn't have a lot of representation, I was eager to go ahead and spread the word about my particular um, subspecialty. But I had to know, what was I walking into? Who are you? And that Google search did not identify how wonderful you guys are as a group. Let me say, from the first moment when I got picked up from Vanessa, you know, in her hot little car, nice little car, by the way, if you've never been given a ride by her, just ask her after this meeting, um, please believe. And as she talked and drove at the same time and I acted a little bit too cautious, <laughs> showing my age, I got a sense of how incredibly busy and involved she is in this campus. And I wondered, is that atypical? Are the rest of you like that? And then I I got to come onto the site where we're having the family physics night and guess what every single person that I ran across showed a dedication and a respect for one another that I did not see in other schools when I go and visit and give a talk so I'm really impressed with you all I love seeing the camaraderie I love seeing the interest in science that I saw across the board and then you guys are totally knocking me off my feet because half of you guys are so atypical to what I think of when I think of science students and I'm just talking about the big old football players and these baseball players and, and all interested in physics. This very thought of these two things being put together, that, such a dichotomy to me. So I just thank you for existing because you have blown my whole perception of what it means to think about a physics undergrad. And so with that being said, because I'm not being facetious, I really am very grateful to have you guys um, invite me here. Let's get into the talk. So I'm going to minimize that and then bring up what I came to talk about. So medical physics from Madame Curie to the MR Linac. And I bet a lot of people in here have probably never even heard of the MR Linac. And so that wonderful little picture that I showed just earlier was just an image of MD Anderson at rest, or so it looked like it was at rest, because it was at night. But please believe it was still humming and churning. So I'm going to discuss what medical physics is, give you a history of our field, let you know what our current clinical practices are, what do we do when I say I'm a medical physicist, what does that mean I do all day, what does that entail, and then if I come 
completely get you guys to drink the Kool-Aid, so to speak. I'll even show you how to join us. Because guess what? I really believe I'm going to open some eyes. Even the girl with her arms crossed in the middle, I do believe at some point they're going to come down and she's going to be like, I think I want to talk to that Julie chick. Maybe I want to be a medical physicist too. So I'm actually going to do something right now. I want you guys to start thinking, when I say medical physics, I'm sure you're already trying to put it together. And those of you who've already heard me speak to you, don't help other people. I want to break this down and help you understand what medical physics means. And that's why we're in, once you understand that, then we're going to go through the history and you'll get better understand what I do in my day-to-day -day job. I want everyone to think about this one question that you should be able to answer in some form. What is physics? Close your eyes. Everyone, go ahead, close your eyes. And when you think of physics, blurt out, what is it that you're thinking? And you're completely not doing it, Kareem. Like, he's just like, forget that. So Kareem, <laughs> Kareem's like, I'm just looking at you. I don't know what you, I, I, I totally saw that. But Kareem, because you don't even close your eyes, thank you. What do you think of when I say, what is physics? What is it? Um, it's pretty much an explanation for why things occur around us. It's like force. There's like a lot of things that fall under. There's a lot of things. Yeah. So what do you think of? When you think of physics, what do you think of? What are some imagery that you guys think of, especially those of you who aren't physics majors? Because I'd love to have, because I have some images of what I think you're thinking about. Come on, just blurt something out. Gray shirt with the, your electricity. Good from the back. Gravity. And gravity, okay. movement, energy. Measurements of all those phenomena. Yes, that's very um, part of, uh, is a big part of physics. And so I'm going to start showing you also, and what I'm shocked of is somebody didn't say something very clear. I thought a lot of people just yell, Einstein, that's my first thought. Shoot, <laughs> hello, like physics. I mean, you only have to be a physicist to think that up. And so most of the times we think of something like force, F equals MA, or E equals MC squared. These are some of the things that traditionally pops out. It didn't happen this time, but it's all right, because you guys are too smart for that. And so, like we said before, you think of electricity, you think of lasers, you think of optics, you think of things spinning, you think of collisions, all of these things. And that breaks down to interactions of matter, doesn't it? At the end of it, we get to just simply understanding how things, how material interacts with each other. That's what physics is. And so, yeah, you didn't think I get all like all sort of like pseudo metaphysical on you. I'm sorry, I, I get like that. So physics, when you break it down, it's just a study of matter, energy, and their interactions. So what happens when I put the medical on top of the physics? What does that become? Now what interactions do I care about? Because it's still physics. Oh, please believe, I'm still a physicist. I may not be what you imagine when you think of a physicist. But at the end of the day, when you say medical physics, how do you put the medical in it? So what kind of interactions am I looking at now? Hmm? Like, like physical therapy? Like physical therapy, different. Human body, yeah, so somehow, now I'm looking at interactions with the human body, but what interaction, what am I expecting to see the interaction between? Because it's always gonna be about interactions, but now, not instead of just talking about matter and energy, I'm talking about the interaction of ionizing radiation with that body. So now we get to talk about X-rays, gamma rays, any type of radioactivity. So now using those for medical purposes to either diagnose or treat any type of human disease. That's what medical physics entails. And of course, that's a wide spectrum of things. So there are very um, different types of medical physicists. You can have a nuclear um, medicine physicist, somebody who's only gonna be talking about um, like uh, different things that using like for PET scanners and so forth, and nuclear med uh, magnetic resonance imaging and things like that. You have also um, radiation safety physicists, people who are just making sure that the world is um, safely using radiation for medical purposes or otherwise. Then you have people like myself who are clinical medical physicists who actually use the same technology that the other physicists use in order to treat, manage, or diagnose patients. Then you also have diagnostic physicists. Yeah, it just keeps on going. And this is all under the umbrella of medical physics. So there's a wide array. So there's, even if you found another medical physicist, doesn't mean they'll be like me. 
Most of us are clinical medical physics, physicists like myself who are just in therapy. But then you do have your diagnostics who only work with CT scanners or MRIs, and they never have to go through the same rigorous um, level of as much um, patient interaction as what I do when it involves actually treating a patient. So there's a whole big world just even within medical physics. And so when we talk about it, I want to tell you a lovely little story about how it all started. Does anyone know who this gentleman is? If you read the link, you can sort of guess. So the Rankin. Anyone ever heard of Rankin? Yay, yay. OK, I don't want this um, pack to fall out the back of my dress. That'd be fun. But what I want you guys to think about is how did it all start? Does anyone have an idea, Rankin and x-rays? What happened? Well, just like most scientists back in the day when the age of discovery, back in the late 1800s, he was sitting around playing with a Crookes tube, and he was doing another experiment, just trying to see how does that work, and playing around to see what happens to the electricity as it passes through the tube, and he expected just to see some light go off. But then, lo and behold, as he did his experiment and made sure he was doing it within a cardboard, light-tight box, all of a sudden, he saw a flicker, not in the box that he was looking in, no, but somewhere near a chair in the back next to a fluorescent screen that he had. That's odd. That's never happened before. And so he thought it was a fluke. We set up his experiment, did it again. By God, the spray is going through my box and lighting up a screen over there. He did it repeatedly, and then he found, lo and behold, what? What did he find? What kind of rays? X-ray. Wow, thank you for helping me. No one helped. No one helped. That was embarrassing. Okay, so x-rays. He is the father of x-rays. And one of the things that was really novel that he did once he had it working, he went to his spouse because that's what you do when you find something exciting, right? You find your wife, and what do you do? Say, give me your hands. And she's like, oh, oh sure, I'll give you my hand. Let me take a picture of it. <laughs> that picture, that x-ray is world famous. How many people have seen that before? You, you've seen it. You have to have seen the Google searches. At least now you will. So this typified the beginning. And from there on, everything started happening literally within that first year, December 1895. I want you to know, right after he did that, not too many months later, Becquerel's like, hold up. Uranium salts, they got some radioactivity too. He discovered that. And of course, it was what? By accident, because he was just playing around with crystals and understanding them better. He put them on a, um, on a sheet, and he noticed, oh my gosh, they're darkening his sheet if I leave them on too long. <gasps> Another form of ray. This continued to happen. So he was special in bringing us uranium salts, and he got his Nobel Prize not alone, but with a beautiful couple, Pierre and um, Madame Marie Curie, Curie, who was the first woman awarded a Nobel Prize. She helped to identify radium and polonium. Now, polonium, she got to actually name it a name which gave credit to her home country. Who can guess which her home country is? Poland, yes, good old Poland. Thank goodness. And I mean, had she been here and um, been from America, been Americunium. So imagine that she not only was odd first because she was a woman in science, obviously a woman professor in physics, but then she gets that Nobel Prize not just in physics, and she gets that alongside her husband and Henry Becquerel, but she gets a second Nobel Prize, the only person to have done that, and the first, in chemistry. So this woman was phenomenal. And she brought us two isotopes that we actually still um, use to this day. And so after that, in 1898, which is just three years after the discovery of the X-ray, you start seeing innovation in this field like no other field. I do not know of another technology, yes, I love radiation, as you can tell, that had got implemented so quickly. Not necessarily safely, but it happened fast. Let's just say, this is super fast. Uh, it really um, boggles the mind. Once you have them discover it, guess what? The world goes x-ray crazy. We have this wonderful little cartoon from the late, 18, um, um, late 1800s showing, showcasing just how people are starting to feel about these x-rays. My god, the wonderful, marvelous x-rays. They can do anything, and they use them and all kinds of ways, ways that are not considered safe as of now and were not safe back then, but because it was brand new, 
everyone was trying to use it for any type of manner of getting to see the anatomy and ways that they haven't been, been able to before. So really understand this era. This is back in Thomas Edison days and everything when you first get the light bulbs and everything. This was super exciting to everyone. And they still didn't quite understand it, as you can tell by this um, nice little cartoon of a, <laughs> yeah, this illustration. <laughs> Think about it. This was a real ad. People were using radiation for all kinds of purposes. We laugh now, but imagine, when they first got it, they didn't understand exactly when it should be applied and when it should not. They were using it for headaches. Yeah. They were using it for hair removal. It'll work. It's still to this day. It'll help your hair to stop growing. Yeah. Any, ladies, anyone want to get rid of some of that hair, extra hair anywhere? And also for your feet. And believe it or not, even to this day, in less, um, lower developed countries, there, um, the quality of your shoes and everything is super important. That really impacts your ability to be mobile and have a good quality of life. So back then, when they had really bad shoes, they were especially trying to fit people, too, and do it nice and precisely. But there's no way now we would ever consider, hey, let's just go ahead and get a foot x-ray. That's right. That's the best way to figure out what size shoe I should wear instead of, you know, just putting your thumb down and feeling. But, I mean, that's us now, you know? So I want you to understand, beyond just the funny parts of them misusing radiation, there were people who decided to use it in a sense that's still medically sound to this day. 1896, we get this gentleman here, Emil Grubb, who had his degree actually in homeopathic medicine. And so he decided to work with this new device because he's like, oh gosh, x-rays are real cool. I see this as being the wave of the future. So he decides to test it out and start seeing what he could do with it. Over the course of time, guess what happened? He developed sores on his hands from having handled these x-ray tubes for so long. And he ran to his doctor. Yeah, the doctor went to a doctor. And his doctor said, well, by golly, if that x-ray can burn your skin like that and cause damage there, what would happen if I harness the power of this x-ray and put it where I want it to destroy tissue? Whoa, that's radiation therapy. That's all we do. That's all we do. We send it where we want to kill things and then retreat, retreat, then we back out. That's it. That's my whole job. I try not to hurt it, you know, hurt the other stuff, and then kill, kill, kill in the middle. That's my whole job, and I try to make it sound really intelligent, but that's it in a nutshell. And so he was one of the first people, after he talked to his doctor and realized, oh my goodness, if I start putting this on little um, epithelial tumors and things that are on the skin and stuff, I can actually see it work and help to treat patients. So he was one of the first doctors that's credited for treating a breast cancer patient with a very um, large tumor that was extending outside of her chest wall. She passed away, but he was able to keep her alive for about a month of treating like that. Then he moved on to other patients, and I believe he opened up his first little radiotherapy clinic just by um, using these old um, type of Crooks tubes. So you can imagine how, uh, how unstable the energy was and how much, um, how much normal tissue he was burning up. But at the same time, it was what is the best um, tool that they had available, because otherwise, think of how gnarly surgery was back then. Things aren't like they are now. It's not that ster it wasn't that sterile back then. So over the course of time, it didn't take but a year before people like Emil Group and others to develop sores and to have growths related to mishandling radiation sources. So I want you to understand, as quickly as it was discovered and as quickly as it was employed to help treat people, we recognize the double-edged swordness of this device. It can both harm and cure all within the same vessel. So you must be very sure how you want to go about using it. So as soon as it came out, we started getting the reports of people saying, uh, this radiation thing isn't as great as what we thought. Yeah, literally fingers were falling off. So people who were handling it, lots of times they'd have it like at carnivals, trying to show off how good it is, and they'd use the same poor little carny to set up the treatments. And so he'd be the one holding the device repeatedly, hours on end. And at the end of the time, of course, what happens to your fingers? They start popping off. So that's what was going on then. And then, back in the day, a case that really stops a lot 
of these um, that's caused a, a, a big stop in a lot of these extraneous uses of radiation where they're actually putting it in drinking solutions because people thought it could cure head yeah it could cause you to be real virile and strong this man even buyers oh he was wealthy he was wealthy he was athletic he was a ladies man oh he was the thing back then even buyers was like Tiger Woods before the fall so I want y'all to understand <laughs> you said you're gonna tape it Lord forgive me but I just want you guys to understand even was big back then everybody loved him and guess what even buyers swore by my radioactive water drink it every day drank it every day till his jaw came off then he passed out died so I want you guys, I'm not lying this you guys are acting like I typed this up I this is history learn your history see this is why I got into science and so this stuff was real they called it what Rady Thor yeah so don't go ahead buying everything at the back of the magazine you know how you when you're just you know really depressed and you start looking oh this will work just five weeks and I can look amazing no let that stuff go even buyers learned and at that moment then people start to really shut down just the mysterious use of um, these devices and so then everything started to get much more te technically sound. We decided what we were going to do as a practice to make sure that we were getting better sources of either x-rays or radioactive, uh, radioactive material. And so people like the Canadians, got to love these Canucks, already in 1951 decided, well, if we want to get beyond orthovoltage um, treatments, meaning having more deeper um, penetrating x-rays, then what can we do to make sure that we're targeting where we want to treat? So as early as 1951 because remember even buyers he passed in 1927 but then in 1951 they were already dreaming what could we do to both image with radiation where we want to treat to protect the normal cells and then to deliver that treatment at that same location that was 1951 and then in 1958 they start getting advanced they start doing what we call portal imaging this is where I get excited and I know the rest of you are not because you don't understand the importance of this but think about it before back in even buyers days and email groups days when they wanted to actually treat a tumor only if they could visualize it could they put it in the right spot dude that's nasty so they could not tell where they should be avoiding or anything. Now, 1958, Stanford, when they were first went at, what they decided to do was to actually start to image the patient with a lower amount of radiation so you have a sense of where the anatomy is. You can then determine exactly where the tumor is and set up your particular device so that it only gives um, radiation to that particular location. When you look at these two ports, notice that this is a double exposure port. And the first one, what you have is just the first image where you just make sure the patient is aligned the second one you only expose on top of the first where you actually want to deliver treatment you open up the portal where you want to deliver treatment and you can tell where they're going to treat right there for that cranial lesion so that still um, that was the first step and us getting to what we call image guided radiation therapy IGRT I'm just dropping these words on you, which mean nothing. But what I want you to understand, we start to get much more accurate and precise at this moment. This is huge. Because before, if I can see it, I can treat it. Now, hey, I know where I want to go. This is where we're going to deliver the dose. It's starting to get much more technical, much more truly medical. The Netherlands love the Dutch. 1961, all of a sudden they create this wonderful gantry, which allows for the actual, um, allow, which allows for the LINAC to actually um, rotate about the treatment couch. The treatment couch is this right here <laughs> and then you actually have a KV imager as well which is going to allow for you to both image the patient and treat the patient in the same position so now you have that 90 degrees from the actual treatment um, device itself so it's perfect you don't have to move the patient to treat them all you have to do is rotate the gantry allow for you to take that portal image know where you want to treat and keeping the geometry the same rotate back so LINAC is then focused at that particular location so that was already in 1961 they realized the Canadian's dream Whoa. That, that's that's deep and then what I want you to understand the rotating gantry guess what it still works to this day this is the same setup that we use for our proton therapy center at MD Anderson currently so this is the MD Anderson proton center in 2012 
It didn't open in 2012, but this is when we took this picture, hence why that date is there. And what I want you to understand, that type of geometry from 1961 till now is still adequate and still good and robust. So I want you to understand the ability to not have to move patient and image and treat at the same time, that is golden. That is the same setup that we have on our linear accelerators as well, which I'll show you a picture of. And so when you move from the first generation, besides just doing like a very standard um, MV port, which you also have available for um, imaging, image guidance radiation, you also have ultrasound that you can use in order to image where you want to actually treat based upon like if they're having prostate therapy or something like that, you're able to see exactly where the prostate is and how full the bladder is so you know whether or not your portals have to be changed in orientation for that treatment to be delivered. You have KV radiographic films that can be taken with the patient still in the treatment position and then not having to be moved. You have the portal imaging, meaning that there's an epid that comes from the bottom of the linear accelerator, which extends below the patient and allows you to image the patient in treatment position so you know they're in the right place. And then you even have little fiducial markers that you can implant in the tumor and watch them dance with transponders on the outside so you know where to send the radiation. And then you can actually time your linear accelerator so that it's delivering when those transducers, when those fiducials are in the right position. So there's so many different things that are available and they continually advance. So when you talk about setting a patient up, how do we go about doing this? Well, there's such a thing as KV cone beam CT, which is using um, low energy um, x-rays in order to actually get a complete cone, uh, CT, but a smaller one using a cone beam phenomenon in order to be able to see it. Then you also have MV CTs that we can do using the actual LINAC itself to deliver the dose. You have your MV portals, you have KV cone beam, and MV as well. And then there's something better, something that I believe I told Dr. Davis, something that causes us to leap almost to the next century and image-guided radiotherapy, and I hope the sound is still good. We are now getting to the point where, guess what, ladies and gents, KV imaging is not enough. MV imaging is not enough. We want even finer detail so we can actually truly see all the normal tissues as they move while you breathe in real time as we deliver the treatment. So what's the only thing that gives super good contrast where you could just tell, even have better granularity so you can even see brain tumors and everything with such a clarity compared to CT scans? What's better than CT? What trumps CT? Oh, did I say Trump? <laughs> what trumps CT? What? MR? Thank you. I would hug you and kiss you, but I won't. I'm going to give you something better than a hug and a kiss. I'm going to let you see this beautiful thing. MR Linac, y'all, the view ray. High contrast soft tissue imaging captured at sub-second speeds. On table dose prediction and reoptimization in under two minutes. Continuous MRI value targeting during radiation therapy treatment. Breakthrough technology that is accurate, adaptive, and physically different. Meridian, the world's first MRI guided radiation therapy system. Only from Pure. All right. So. That gives you a taste. I know like a lot of you are like, oh, that just looks like a cartoon. I don't know what they're really doing. Guess what? That's actual real. They are actually treating patients and have been doing so for the last couple of years, almost two to three years, depending on the center that you go to. So when we talk about an MR LINAC, imagine if you took an MRI, which gives you that beautiful fidelity to be able to see all the soft tissue contrast that you need in order to see really small tumors with much more precision than what you can see in a CT scan where it looks blurred. Imagine if you could get that during the treatment and allows you to then change the fields that you have for your linear accelerator so it can track your tumor as you breathe, as you move, and do this continuously and update the treatment plan and the entire treatment course on, in real time. That's what that delivers. Now, of course, the QA and everything is a bear to talk about. But what this shows you is our progression that we're moving. We are moving from where we are just taking lumps of radioactive material and just putting them on superficial tumors to now being able to say with precision, oh, I can see where your pineal tumor is. I know what I want to do. I'm going to have you on this MR LINAC. Your treatment will be about X amount of minutes, and we will treat you as you breathe without anything holding you down or in this particular orientation. That's 
where we are. This is your generation. When you decide to um, move into, perhaps if you choose my field, these are the type of equipments that you might actually get a chance of working with. Otherwise, the workhorse is what we call the regular LINAC, one that doesn't have a fancy MR scanner attached. So to show you more appreciation for why you should have been like, oh my God, with the MR LINAC, let's take it back to the 1956 with the first LINAC in the Western Hemisphere at Stanford. So imagine if this have been your setup compared to that MR Linac. This is how we started. So I want you to have a very good sense of what, how far we've come with the ability with our electronics to this day to shrink down a gantry from that size. And here's a child being treated. He was the first kid, first person treated on that Linac. He had, he was a two year old with, I believe, an eye tumor. And they had this poor child just sit on the edge of that. Couch. Yeah, but it saved his life. And so it was a good treatment, but you can see this is, think of the scale from what we are shrinking down to, to now, hello, this is modern day. And we try to make it much more nice. We try to make it less sterile, even in the space here. Imagine, now we actually have these things, sky shine, um, fake sky shines, where they have beautiful little scenery on the walls. When you first come into our vault, even though everything is thickly shielded and all that because it's radiation, still, you get a sense of, oh wow, it's not that bad. It almost feels like a cheesy spa. It's nice. We try our best to make you feel like you aren't with us. And then, I mean, if you go to this place in Atlanta, I keep wanting to go work at this center. I mean, <laughs> it's a nice full wall with plants growing. It's, it's very nouveau. I love this. And so we are moving to make sure that the patient experience is as pleasant as possible, and it helps the morale of the staff that has to be in the room. So when we talk about current devices, there are a plethora of different devices. But when it breaks down to what we normally would see being used, depending upon what you have at your center, most likely you will have a freestanding linear accelerator, a true beam, or just some other variant 2100, which looks essentially the same. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Then tomotherapy, which almost delivers the radiotherapy like a CT scanner in slices. You have the view ray, which is the MR Linac, which I showed you now. And then for doing any um, uh, simulations where you actually get the CT scan before the treatment, you You'd have like your Philips scanner or whatever version you guys have available. And also if you're doing brachytherapy type treatments where we still use radioactive seeds and we implant, implant them in tumors, you would use these nucleotron devices, which are um, pretty um, small in size and very, um, uh, they're sort of like, they're heavily shielded little tanks and they actually allow you to send the seeds out in these um, nice little plastic tubes to the location that you determine. And so when it comes to the LINAC, which is the workhorse of radiotherapy, it is a beautiful device. I love mine. I have pictures on my cell phone of mine. I forgot to put her in the um, in the presentation because I just got her. She's brand new. She's Her name is Trubeam5 or Rin, like I like to call her because it's a celebrity name in my head. Um, and so one of the things that we love about it is the fact of what it can do. With this device, I can utilize eight different energies in order to reach tumors of any depth that I choose within a human body. What is amazing about it also, here I'm going to try to explain really quickly at the far right end, if you're if this way, or I should say left because I'm facing you and this is my left hand, you have the electron gun which sends out the electrons which are then propelled through this accelerating waveguide and they come out in little bunches and then because of the different RF signal in each little bunch, they are accelerated even more until they have their um, exit velocity that they need and at this end portal where they meet the beautiful bending magnet. They meet the bending magnet because they need to actually hit the patient at the bottom because if otherwise they're just coming out of the waveguide and going straight uh-oh, they don't come out of the portal that we shape for the tumor. Bummer. So that's why we have that bending waveguide here, which bends them about 270 degrees. Then they interact with some type of piece of metal. Um, it'll be a scattering foil if we want electrons and just bend their project trajectory a little bit. If we want photons and we have a flattening filter, which helps to flatten them to a nice little intensity that we like. And then we have these little shapers here. So you have a big old jaw that's a big, um, big metal um, shields that help to focus the beam. And then you also have MLCs, which shape them really finely. There's these beautiful little lead pieces that actually help to shape electronically to any configuration that you want to shape it so that it protects the normal tissues near where you're trying to deliver the dose and only stay open where the dose is that you want to deliver. So that's the LINAC in a nutshell. And I just want you to have a sense. This is like, I mean, if I were a cop, this is my service pistol, you know? It, that's that's my ace. That's all I play with all day. Everything else, the nucleotron stuff, brachytherapy, if I were in a service that needed that.
And so what's so special about these devices? Well, it depends upon what they are used for. When I have a linear accelerator, I get electrons and I get photons, which I use for treatment. But if I had something special, like a proton center, like we do have at MD Anderson, there are different way, ways and reasons why I would want to use that proton therapy center versus using my photon LINAC. It's because of the type of dose profile that it gives off. What do you notice here that's really special? If I have in the blue, um, in the blue curve, that shows the trajectory of a photon in going at depth in water. What you'll notice is that as it goes deeper into the water, it has a nice um, slow fall off and it's continuous continually um, leaving out, um, depositing dose. But if I look and check to see if I have a proton, which is that orange trajectory, which overlaps with the red for the most part, what you'll notice is that, oh my goodness, it comes in sort of shallow and then it peaks up with the amount of intensity of the dose that it's delivering, and then it has its peak, and then what happens? Peters out dramatically, just falls off like a cliff. But you know what's cool about that cliff? Hello, it's not pushing any more dose beyond that, right? So if I had a normal tissue here, right about, I believe about 12 cm at depth, guess what? That heart, that lung, whatever is spared. But if I have a photon, what happens at 12 cm? I'm still depositing about 40% of that dose. So if I know that I'm working with like a, a, a PD or something like that, and they have medulloblastoma, and I'm treating both the brain and the whole entire spine, then I know I can treat that PD with assurance, knowing that I'm not giving the kidneys or anything else when I treat the spine any dose if I'm using protons. But you know what's even cooler? Because you know as you guys come out, what's everyone talking about? Heavy ions, man. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting heavy with it because the reason why protons deliver dose in that manner compared to, pro um, to photons is because they have mass. So it's all you big guys up in here and your big old guns. You know what's good about you? You guys are like protons and carbon ions. Look at how they deliver dose. So notice how dramatically carbon comes in. It comes in stealth, man. It comes in like what a black seal. And then all of a sudden it goes to its peak, maximum delivering dose exactly where you want it in a very tight from, um, a, a spatial um, orientation. And then it drops off like it's hot just like a proton. So I want you to understand the difference. And this is why you're gonna notice Dallas and a couple other places, I won't make any more names, are gonna start to have these heavy ion centers. And so this is why they're putting all this money because it's gonna cost a lot. And what I suggest for you guys who are in physics and you wanna get in some of the, involved in some of these projects, hello, hit Dallas up, hit up these new centers, tell them, oh, I heard a talk about you know, medical physics and hey, are you guys gonna have a carbon facility? Just let me in, I'll help, I'll clean, whatever. I'm telling you, honestly, I'm excited by it. You know, And so I just wanted to give you a sense for why people are creating all these different kinds of centers and why it's worth all that cost. And so why, um, <clears throat> why do we do radiotherapy still? Because remember I told you about all the harmful effects. You're like, well, I don't understand, Dr. Pollard, didn't you say people's fingers were falling off and all this stuff? This doesn't sound good. This isn't kosher. It helps when you use it in the right way. Radiotherapy is an amazing tool especially in the correct hands. When you're getting it as a part of a package deal with other types of therapy, such as hormonal therapy, chemotherapy, when you sandwich this all together, it gives you a better um, survival overall. And so you'll notice that what's left off this particular chart is that they should have also included also surgery. Because in a lot of instances, radiotherapy is your option to surgery, or sometimes it's added after surgery if necessary, if there's, a local, if there's spread beyond the local disease. So what I want you to understand is that this not, it's not a standalone treatment. We are part of the regimen that helps to go about treating cancer patients. And so I would say um, most statistics say now about 70 percent, 50 to 70 percent of patients have radiotherapy as part of their treatment course, depending on the tumor type and so forth. And so the process of treatment, first we start off with doing imaging. Everything starts with imaging because we need to know our anatomy. I need to know where to put the dose. So we do a CT scan or some other type of imaging scan. Then we go about doing the prescription. The doctor, a radiation oncologist, says how much dose needs to be delivered. Then the radiation oncologist defines where they want to actually deliver the dose to. And then everyone else does all the treatment planning and preparation. So the doctor comes in and says, yeah, radiation can help in this amount, in this location. And then they bow out.
and the rest of us, oh my gosh, let's make it work. Let's make it work. Just like Tim Gunn from <laughs> Project Runway. So I want you to understand, that's what happens in a long shot. There are a lot of people involved. We have people named Osimetrists who actually create the treatment plans. And so they're the ones who play my favorite game called Shoot That Tumor. That is their whole life. If you like video games, check out Dosimetry. Just type that in, Radiation Therapy Dosimetry, and see what pops up. We have a great program. After that, then we bring the plan that the dosimetrists create, and we check it as physicists and show it to the doctor. The doctor says, oh, does this meet the tolerances for the normal tissues and cover the dose to, um, to the tumor that I like? If they like it, great. Everybody signs off, and then we begin more work. We do all the QA to make sure that fingers don't fall off, that no more normal tissue that should have been exposed gets exposed. We actually run the treatment plan on fake patients known as um, actual phantoms. And so we measure the dose to them and determine whether or not that is exactly what the treatment planning software said. And once we are all happy with that, yay, we bring out the patient and then we actually start doing our setup verification. Yeah, you don't stop the QA. QA keeps happening and notice that it's just for the patient. On top of that, we do our QA for our, for our guns, our linear accelerator. So you're doing that on a continual basis too. So there's so much involved in this treatment process and so many different jobs involved with that as well. And so when it comes to types of treatment, we offer a plethora of treatments. If we we're only talking about the brain, you can imagine if there's a case where you have some focalized disease, but you do also have small METs all distributed about metastasis um, spread throughout the brain, then they could get a whole brain treatment. This is all determined by the physician. Position. Then if they have just sort of localized disease with just a little bit of extension, then you can have a traditional, what we call 3D conformal, where you to conform the MLC shape to just that lesion and just a little bit of a margin so you can help to control that extraneous disease. And then if they only have like a stage one tumor and you know there's no extension and you know for a shadow of a doubt you don't need to give dose anywhere else, guess what? You stereo that sucker. Now stereo, why do I get excited? Because that's my specialty. That, that just brings out a little dance. So stereotactic, that refers to having everything so rigid and so perfect that you know that coordinate system within a millimeter. Meaning that I can actually go in like that stealth fighter that I talked about before and drop a heinous amount of dose and know with a certainty that it's okay because only place that I'm delivering it has been already uh, approved because of my stereotactic frame setup. So therefore, I know there's no wiggle room, nothing's gonna move, it's okay to bomb the heck out of it and then back out. That's when you can do stereo, when you know you only need to deliver dose to a particular location and you can deliver it that hard. So we have um, stereotactic body radiotherapy where you treat lesions outside of the brain. That's what I do. I'm in the thoracic service and so I treat lots of lung disease that happens to be stage one, meaning that we know all the disease is confined to a very localized location and guess what? I get to find it and like black ops, shoot it. I love it. It's my favorite job in the world, and I mean, it helps to save lives. The characteristics of it are, number one, you have to know with a certainty that anatomy. You need to know where you're going before you start dropping dose, um, you know, like that. Then you have to be able to position the patient in that frame or that setup in that manner every single day. So you have to create some type of positioning for that. You need to make sure that you can reduce all normal tissue exposure to as low as you can that's achievable. Then you have to make sure that you're aware of all the body emotions that happen that people cannot control because breathing causes emotions that you must account for even as you're delivering radiation then you have to make sure that you have really good um, registration of those targets compared to normal diseases and normal tissues and then finally it's not stereotactic body radiotherapy unless you have a heck of a lot of dose so that means dropping almost six times the dose that you would get normally for one fraction in one so a typical fraction is two gray. What I give for my patients who are getting stage one um, SBRT for thoracic service, it's 12.5. So when you know you have no room for error because you're dropping that much more dose, everything gets checked that much more um, and gets that much more scrutiny. So because of that, we put the patients in a creel. They're not just laying on the table like, hey, how you doing? Oh, it's all right. How you doing, Mr. So-and-so? No, we tighten them up with these beautiful devices, which are like bean bags when they are completely um, full of pressure. But then when you suck out and like, just like a vacuum seal and um, pressurize it, then it conforms very rigidly to the body, causing them not to be able to move as well as they would like. 
Then we go ahead and CT them and get a sense of where the lesion is. Once that happens, then we have the physicians assist us in actually contouring and denoting in red where the target is. We call it the GTV, gross tumor volume. They indicate that, and then they also indicate margins of where they want the dose to spread. After that, we go and use that CTCN with all the contours the doctor has just created and create this treatment plan. This is a snapshot of what a treatment plan looks like when you have the dose display on, and it tells you where the dose should go. And so now I know based upon what the software says, this is where we would like the dose to be oriented in such a way to help to give treatment to that disease. After this has been created, we show it to the doctor, let them know, because the, um, in what we call dose volume histograms, how much dose, all these other nearby structures. Because notice, there's collateral damage, fellas. There's a lot of collateral damage that you have to keep, keep account of. So you have portal veins, you have the aorta. Aorta is right there in the beam path of um, a lateral beam. And so you need to make sure when you orient all these beams, what is the best arrangement? And so that is my job too, making sure that I overlook all of these different um, um, little details to make sure are we delivering the safest plan possible and a nice hot plan to cause the best tumor control as well. And so when it comes to how do we go about doing this, the techniques have evolved over the years. I think I've even mentioned that to Dr. Davis. We go from 3D conformal where it was just nice um, one, um, one shaped MLC com um, confirmation to now IMRT where you have the leads actually moving to very different um, positions to help to modulate the dose so that it's less intense in certain areas to spare that aorta or that extra lung that you're trying to protect to now VMAT where everything moves at the same time while the beam is still on. So everything is changing at the same time. The QA, all of the, um, all the things that we have to look at and monitor have just gone up exponentially. So I want you to understand that old, old 3D conformal, just treating big parts of the lung, those days are over. We are now in the VMAT era. And so this helps to bring it down for you really easily. You know what our intent is. We wanna treat something with such fine detail and precision that you could get as nice an image as that. But how we started was that four field blocks. That's all we could do. We could just sort of get lead blocks and sort of try to, to have a two dimensional shape um, to the field. Then we moved to conformal radiotherapy where we try to give it more depth and precision then to 3D conformal radiation therapy. And finally, now with VMAT, we are here at the end. And so when it talks about 3D conformal, this is what I mean. You get the MLCs to create big block shapes very straightforward, very robust. Why? Because it's easy to get the monitor unit calcs for determining how much that dose should be compared to what the software is saying, but it helps you treat a lot of gross disease. And especially if you have stage three or stage four, these are the type of treatment fields that the patients will be getting. And so when we talk about VMAT case, usually that's because you're talking about, um, especially in the case of SBRT, very well-defined disease that you need to have so much modulation that you're sparing everything else. And what I want you to, you um, probably can appreciate too well, all of the high dose profiles are all up against the chest wall over tumor. Everything else getting such low dose on the order of just 10% of the prescription dose. So you have just spared the heck out of that lung compared to what you'd have with 3D conformal. And so when we talk about the size of the MLC shape, it's small. For most of our um, SBRT cases, we're talking about 2CM by 2CM um, MLC arrangement size. And when it comes to what the console looks like when I'm delivering a treatment for a patient, I as the physicist, guess what? I don't beam on on a patient. We have people known as radiation therapists that actually align the patient on the table under my direction and actually are allowed by law, Texas law and um, whatever state you live in, to hit that beam on button and the doctor is allowed. As the physicist, although I QA the machine, although I set it up, I calibrated it, guess who does not beam on the patient? Me. I am not the person authorized to do that. Can I stop you if you were the therapist from doing it? Oh yeah, I have every right to say no beaming on. Stop what you're doing, back away from my machine. I can do that. But as far as who runs it, that's a radiation therapist. So if you're a really warm, loving person and you like dealing with patients every day and you um, are interested in this field, that is another avenue. What they get to interact with is the console on the machine itself, which tells you this information. It lets you know um, what the fields are that came 
from that particular treatment planning system that we created to deliver that treatment, and it lets you know which field is moded up so you know what type of radiation is about to deliver to that patient. It lets you know what the MLC orientation is. It'll show you when all the leaves come together, and you can compare that to whatever we say in the treatment plan, and you know if that's accurate and whether it's being um, done properly by the machine. Also, it gives you a view right away, if you're on the TrueBeam module, of what the patient is doing in the room as you deliver treatment. This is so sweet, and this is really what you see on the two-screen console. Then on your right-hand side, I have pulled up the 3D 3D matching tool, which allows you to look at that cone beam CT that you just took of the patient in the treatment room that moment and compare that to the planning CT from the treatment planning software. So you know what you want the patient to look like. You know where they should be, and you compare that to where they are now. You compare those two, you move the patient until those contours match to where you like, just like what you see here, and it tells you how much you have to move the patient on the couch in order to get that to match, and it can move the patient for you. You hit that, and you treat, and you're done. That's it in a nutshell. So this is what it looks like if you were to come to a radiation therapy center. And so when we talk about image-guided radiotherapy, you're like, why do you need to image the patient? I don't understand. What's the big deal? Just you have the treatment plan, you got the patient, treat them. Well, stuff like this. I mean, the fact that I'm treating the lung and I'm actually having to look out and spare the lung means I need to know where the tumor is within it as I deliver treatment. Hence, this is why we need image-guided radiotherapy. Because unless you stop them from breathing, and guess what, I can do that too. We have these things known as breath hold treatments, where you make them hold their breath and you only deliver the treatment when they hold their breath and have the tumor staying still in the position that you want. So without that, you have to then contour this huge area of lung, normal lung in order just to hit that little tumor. So this is why we need image-guided radiotherapy to always confirm we are treating what we thought. Otherwise, you miss the tumor as you see here if I were not to account for that breathing motion. So SBRT, it improves outcomes. Delivering dose in this manner, really hot, high, um, high dose per fraction, really delivers great local control. As you can see, SBRT treatments compared to just having surgery, which is shown here in orange. Hello, local control looks better, regional control looks better, everything looks better. And you didn't have your chest cracked open. I mean, when you think about that, this is why people are now considering SBRT, especially for lung, compared to surgery. So the problem is that one of the things that we notice is that cancer is now being um, something that's becoming a problem all over the world. But of course, the lesser developed countries are having a much bigger issue because although they don't have as high an incidence, here you have less developed countries below compared to the more developed regions on top, you notice their incidence is lower than ours, but hello, the mortality is almost equal to their incidence. Why? Because they don't have access to beautiful centers like what we have here. In fact, the whole problem also also is that the incidence isn't even for sure because they don't have access to good diagnostic tools to know if they even have cancer in the first place. So we wish they had the same access to care like us. And so therefore we think radiotherapy can help. And if you look at this particular graph, one thing I can tell you is that here in the green, that means that you have five or more um, radiotherapy machines per million for the people. And what you'll notice is that when you go to less developed areas, the Far East and Africa and South America, they are lacking hugely. But at the same time that they need radiotherapy, who else do they need at the radiotherapy center? They need the people, the well-trained medical physicists, which could be you. <laughs> and we can help to make sure that they have the treatments that they need. And so this is our next big role. As medical physicists, not only do we treat the patients that we have at our particular center, we do outreach. That's one of the things that I do. I, I just uh, went to Morocco last year and we're working in um, trying to bring up a medical physics program in Tanzania. So what I want you to know is that as a medical physicist, you can do outreach. You, and when I say outreach, it's not just you know coming to San Antonio. It's like <laughs> you can go anywhere. And so we have physicists that go back home to China, and they help to um, train people there. And so our role is so vital in the fact that we do so much to help to control the treatments that are delivered at our center, we better understand how to bring something from the ground up in remote settings. And so when you look at the world populations, there's about 7 billion people, and right now there's only um, 18,500 physicists. So that means about three physicists per million people. But when you get to the undeveloped countries, nobody, because there's no machine to work on and there's no personnel that understands how to use it. The big push on us now from APM, our American Association of Physicists and Medicine, is that we develop at least double that. 
so that we can help to go out and bring up the um, undeveloped countries and their um, radiotherapy resources. So believe it or not, there is a dire need, not just for equipment, but for young, brilliant, future medical physicists who have an interest in helping the world. And so this is um, my latest endeavor, but we can help them in clinical service and developing new research tools and teaching them as far as administration so they understand how to run a center. And so how do you become one of us? It's very simple. You do what you're doing now if you're already in a BS program in physics. Then you go for either your MS or your PhD in medical physics, and now you must, you must, you must do a clinical residency if you want to be a clinical medical physicist. And that can be in any accredited residency program in any of these fields, diagnostic, health physics, nuclear, or rad onc. And then you must take a certification exam and, of course, you know, pass. And so there is a, an accrediting organization known as CAMPEP, don't worry, I have the link, which tells you which program is accredited so that you can join this field, please check out that website. And only the places listed on the website, I, I emphasize this, only those places should you go to. Don't go to a place that says, hey, give us some money, give us $50,000 and we'll get you the degree. Check CAMPEP out. Make sure they're okay. They have a list of all of their accredited graduate programs in my field as well as the other fields, diagnostic as well. And so right now we have about 50 of those programs and we have almost 100 residency programs programs for you to get that clinical training should you want to enter this field as well. So there's something new, and I mentioned this before, it's probably like about the last slide. We have our new DMP program, the Doctorate of Medical Physics, which sounds like the PhD, but it's nothing like it. It's guaranteed to give you a residency because a residency you have to apply for just like anything else but if you get this DMP this doctorate of medical physics it is a professional degree meaning you have a two-year program of didactic study which is even better than what you have in a master's program because guess what right now most of these places say you don't have to write a dissertation you just do two years of classwork understanding medical physics better then two years a clinical residency guaranteed and so it's a four-year total program where you walk out the door with that DMP and you go right to work. And so you have that path compared to going the traditional route of the PhD plus the clinical residency and then trying to find a job. So this is something brand new. And right now um, we are trying to get that. Um, so you have one really close to you, actually, at um, UTSA. But there's also going to be one coming up at MD Anderson. So these programs are in high demand is, I, I don't know um, what the turnaround is for the people who, you know, whether for acceptance and so forth, but we are getting more of these places coming up sooner than, um, sooner than you think. So please, if you're interested, let me know. But the resources for you to consider if you have any questions about this, campep.org, aapm.org, and astro.org. These are our major sites. This is where you get all the information on us. APM can take you to anything you need. CAMPEP lets you know what's accredited. Astro lets you know the relationship with our radiation oncologist, the doctor side. So that should be it. That was the source for where I got that talk. Thank you guys so much. And of course, any questions? Thank you. That's a very good question. So, of course, it will depend on how difficult the case is. So, if I have like a stage four where it's just pretty much you know you're going to do almost like a hemithorax when you're treating almost the entire um, left lung or right lung, then that's pretty simple. I'm going to have an AP and a PA, um, a field coming from the front and a field coming from the back. I can do that dose calc in my head, and you can get them treated same day. That can happen within an hour. But if I have a patient with um, a tumor that somehow wraps around a normal structure that I'm really trying to avoid, like something that's really close to the heart or anything like that, three to five days usually is the turnaround. And we actually create those times just to allow for us to do the QA so I can make sure that it's safe. It's not because it takes so long with the software. Oh, the software can create a plan so quick. Pretty much within an hour you have what you need, but then it's up to you to determine is it safe to proceed. That is your job as a physicist. So not only are you just trying to crank it out, you're trying to make sure I don't kill anyone today.
that's you know that's always my goal you know i don't want to end up in the news i don't want to say hey remember dr pollard oh snap no i don't want i don't want to be in the news yeah i don't want to be in the news yeah any other questions go ahead why do you think there's less uh cancer cases in less developed countries oh that's a very good question. And so right now, the belief, there isn't proof because there aren't enough diagnostic tools to show it, but we believe because of the fact that they don't have enough pathologists, that they don't have enough scanners, they don't have enough in the imaging facilities to do the diagnostic tests to determine whether or not they have cancer before they die, this is why the numbers look low. They have so little, they have so few resources in order to truly catalog and keep a record. Just medical records keeping is actually something we are trying to teach um, to a lot of our sister centers. So once they get to that point where they have good medical record keeping, then we'll know. And I'm actually scared because once we get the real number, um, you know, 36,000 physicists, I don't know. I really don't know how many more we could keep asking for because just to say 18,000, that's where we're at now. If we want double, I, I need everyone in this room just to sign up right now. Like, think about it, and then have a kid, and then sign them up before they even talk. So, I mean, when you think about it, I'm scared when that real number comes out. And unfortunately, it's because um, now that everyone's um, living longer because of all the immunizations and everything, you're starting to see these people live past 50, and now they're developing cancers. But we don't have enough um, tools. And these are simple things. If you want to go in mechanical engineering or something, help develop tools that allow for us to have these um, diagnostic tests and something robust that you can hold in your hand and walk over literally to like a campsite and be like, hey, let me just get a quick blood sample for you and know right away. But there's a lot of things like in microfluidics, I'm sorry, from UCLA, they are working on some things like that. So you guys, you can help in so many different avenues. You don't even have to be a physicist. You can do so much to help us answer those questions. Yeah. Okay, well, um, let's thank our speaker one more time. Aww. Thank you a little bit, you guys. Aww, thank you. For more information, please visit tlu.edu.